Hey, good evening, everybody, to God be the glory. Glad you're with us. And uh, this is Vegas Christian Center, and the vision of Vegas Christian Center is to BAM, to build, advance, and manifest the kingdom of God in the life of God's creation, living in Las Vegas, the nation, and the world. To God be the glory. Well, we want to welcome, if you're watching for the first time, we want to welcome you. We thank God for you. And uh, we're just, just honored and privileged to be able to share the word of God with you on today. So uh, Vegas Christian Center is located at 3465 West Craig Road. Suite B is in Boy, North Las Vegas, Nevada, 89032. Our mailing address is P.O. Box 751615, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89136. For those of you that desire to text in, you may do so, 702-518-2822. That's 702-518-2822. And um, if you'd like to support the ministry, you may do so at www.paypal.me slash vccbam. That's paypal.me slash vccbam. And we want to like to encourage you to share, like, and subscribe to our uh, social media platforms. That way we can stay connected and we, you can still continue and get updates about what's happening in the ministry as well as getting the regular uh, streaming information that comes up for those of you that, uh, that, that use those uh, mechanisms, mechanisms of communication. So with that being said, I'm gonna get in, we're going to get right into the word. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get right into the word. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise and thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that the interest of your word continues to bring light, clarity of thought, and understanding to the hearts, minds, and souls of the hearers. I decrease so that your spirit within me would increase, and I ask that you think through my mind, speak through my lips, help me articulate information and knowledge so that your people can be strengthened, edified, encouraged, and instructed in righteousness. We covet earnestly that the best gifts of the Spirit are in operation to minister and to meet the needs of your people. Satan, we remind you that your power is broken, rendered null and void. You cannot come in to kill, steal, destroy, nor pluck up the seeds of God's word, which will be planted into the hearts of the people. I break and counsel every time I'm using my authority. And Father, for it all, we promise to give you and you alone all the praise, honor, and glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. All right. <clears throat> We've been talking about our paradigm of late. And um, of late is relative <laughs> uh, for quite a while. And I believe it's something that we all need to understand. This thing of abandonment is, uh, is, is pretty bad. But what happens is when things get abandoned, we learn what the expectations are from our life. What are the expectations? And so I titled tonight, God's Expectation. What does God expect from us as his children? <clears throat> Excuse me. What is God expecting to do in the life of, in your life? What does he want? You know, that's the first question you might want to ask somebody when you engage with them. It's like, okay, what do you expect of me? What are the expectations? I was given a job interview recently and uh, I had, it's important at the beginning to understand the expectations so that a person doesn't necessarily just apply for the job just for the sake of getting a job because they want a job. But if they don't know what to expect and you don't explain your expectations, then you won't, they may never uh, uh, arise to the level that you want them to get to. So you have to let the, the expectations be known up front. I think when we got saved and got born again, we forgot to ask that question. God, what do you expect out of me? Well, you know, we forgot to ask that question. What are God's expectations out of us as his children and as believers? And especially when we get or have gotten disconnected through some form of abandonment, some form of hurt, some form of uh, what I call uh, 
uh, post-traumatic sin disorder. We're all suffering from the post-traumatic e elements of what's, what this uh, sin dilemma has plagued us with. Okay, so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to look at, and I'm not sure if I want to look at it from New Living Translation. Um, I may want to, <clears throat> excuse me, Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to look at verse 1 through 7. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 through 7. Okay, let me read it from the New Living Translation. This is what it says. It says, These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline. What are God's expectations? <laughs> Okay, we can stop right there and preach all day till Jesus comes back. Okay, so we know Proverbs is a book of wise sayings. And in, in this, when we look at Proverbs, they're not promises. Okay, you got to understand that. Proverbs are not promises. They're just wise sayings. If you govern yourself, by and large, if you govern yourself by these principles, you will have the corresponding return and get the results, by and large. What doesn't factor into the equation is people's minds, mindsets, attitudes, and their will, what they choose to do. God's expectation is that we would do what he wants us to do. Man's expectations is that we will do what we want to do. We will do what we are conditioned to do. We will do what our five physical senses commands us to do. What we see, smell, taste, touch, and hear. Our five physical senses tries to drive us to do certain things that go against God's expectations. But fortunately, God, by his spirit, has given us the element of faith, which has the capacity and ability to override the five physical senses. The scripture says without faith, it is impossible to what? Please God. But it also goes on to say in that same passage that even though it's impossible to please God without faith, he says, uh, oh God, help me, Lord Jesus. Without faith is impossible. Okay, he that believes that God is, that he's a, he becomes, he is God, the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God's expectation is that we will diligently pursue, diligently hunger and thirst for what the Heavenly Father wants for us to do. When we do what God is, commands us to do and purpose to live by his expectations for our lives, by and large, I mean, you will have persecution, you will have attacks, you will, you know, suffer different things that may occur because our bodies with these five physical senses are still subject to sin, are still subject to the effects of our environment, and, you know, it's subject to the things that we see. But when, when, we, uh, but when we choose to operate in faith, faith causes us to rise above what our physical senses are telling us. Faith has the capacity to tap into the invisible because you got to believe that God is, and faith is acting on what you believe. Faith is the, these are all passages of scripture, faith is the substance, the tangibility. Faith is the substance of things, what? Hope for, it is, faith is the evidence of things not seen or perceived with the physical senses. Okay. Yeah. That's what faith is what's not perceived by the physical senses. So God has equipped every human being with the capacity to walk in faith, to stand in faith, to believe, and to learn how to trust something they cannot see with their physical eyes. That's what faith is, to believe and to confess what you don't see until it begins to manifest. But where do you see it? You have to get a perception of it on the inside so that you can manifest it on the outside. So what do you see? What are you, what are you paying attention to? What are you watching? 
Are you watching your physical circumstances or are you focusing in on what the word of God says about who you are and what you have and what you can do in Christ Jesus? Okay, so back to Proverbs now. Now you understand why I stopped at this first thing. He says their purpose, the purpose of Proverbs, these are God's expectations. It wouldn't be in the Bible if it wasn't his expectations. He says to teach people wisdom. I'm reading from New King, New Living Translation. To teach people wisdom, practical understanding of your knowledge, wisdom, and discipline. To not give up in the midst of a battle. Listen, to help them understand the insights of the wise. That's what God wants for us. Insight, perception. I'm always teaching about vision. That's what God, I believe God has given me that mandate. That mandate is on my life to help people understand vision. Insight or wisdom or perception on the inside. To see something that you, uh, to see, in, in, I'm not talking about seeing physically. I'm saying to see, to have in perception, to have wisdom, to have understanding, to have clarity. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I mean. Do we, are we connecting? Do we connect? To help them understand the insight of the wise. He says, these wise sayings, this insight of the wise, their purpose is to peop teach people to live disciplined and successful lives. Now, success is relative to people. Success is determined by the eye of the beholder. They say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? You've heard that saying. Well, success, successful lives is in the eye of the beholder. Why do I say that? Is because people have different levels of what success is. To one, to the person who is homeless, success for them might be to, if I could just find me a cardboard box for tonight. That might be what their expectation of, of success is. To a person who is, you know, average and, you know, they just, you know, just barely making it or they, you know, they're not sleeping on the street, but to them, success might mean you know, if I could just make sure I got food on my table for tonight. Success is, means different things. To a rich person, success might be, I want to have a yacht instead of just a small boat. It's all relative. Amen. I determine success, this is my definition of success, is determined by how well I'm being obedient and following God's expectations for my life. Amen. That's Amen. the measure of success for me. Am I doing, am I giving God 100% of my life or, I, or am I only giving God uh, 80%? I'm gonna hold back 20%, I'm gonna let give God 80% of my life. So success is determined by how well I am obedient to do what it is that God has told me to do. When he speaks into our lives, he, he is trying to bring us to a level of successfulness the way I see it. Right? No. No, that's not right. It's according to what? How he sees it. So we have to measure our level of success against what he says. So his objective is that we, that we all live successful lives. Disciplined and successful lives. To help them do what is right, just, and fair. So if somebody is not being honest, there, uh, it didn't say honest, although we could put honest in there. Do what is right, just, and fair. That's God's expectation. God wants us to live a life that's just, Fair, and what else was the third one? And right. So what does that mean? What, we have to have clarity of thought. 
We have to have an understanding, okay, this is what God wants for my life. He wants me to live right, or another word for right, or righteous, a righteous life. A righteous life basically means to have right standing with God. That's what righteousness means, okay? To have a right relationship with God. God wants us to be right. That's, I mean, that's not, that's not hard to fathom or not. That's not hard. That's not, that's not some successful expectation that's so high where the bar is so high and no one can reach it. This is what God expects. This is what he wants from us, that we will live right, just, and fair. Verse 4, he says, these proverbs will give insight to the simple. Insight. We could all use some insight. Perception. The ability to see. When I can, when I can get perception and understanding, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, one, I'm the kind of person, one of my favorite sayings is, keep it simple. I don't put that last part on there. But just keep it simple. Uh, we, used to, we had a phrase that we would say in children's church back in the day. Keep it simple and make it fun, right? That was it. Right. Keep it simple and make it fun. If we make this thing fun, if we make walking with God fun so that people can see that you can have fun in the things of God, it, I don't think it'd be too difficult to get people to want to be saved. But when we put a lot of man-made constraints, man-made entanglements, man-created um, rules, policies, guidelines, procedures, and we think we have to jump through all those religious hoops in order to live a right, fair, and just with God. God doesn't want us to feel like that. That's what, that's what condemnation is. That's what, that's what the scripture talks about when it's talking about a yoke. It's a yoke of bondage. It's a yoke that keeps people from being free to serve the Lord, to be able to enjoy, enjoy their salvation. You know, I might get in trouble for saying what I'm about to say, but that's okay. You know, um, when I got saved, we, we were told, well, we weren't, even, we weren't even told this. We just did it for some reason. <clears throat> we threw away all our records. We threw away all our albums. Did you do that? No. No? no? Cheryl, you didn't do that? Did you even listen to music? No. <laughs> You know, we, we get rid of, we, we're thinking that that's what makes us holy. Right. You know, we're dressing a certain way in a certain attire. You know, when you go to church, you always got to wear a suit and tie. You know, we, we're raised in these environments that, that by what we see, because the, what's wrapped up in the environment are things that we see. And so we just, oh, we go, oh, okay, so as Christians, this is what I'm supposed to do. And then we carry about acting the same way, doing the same thing. And then when we moved to Las Vegas, boy, the first thing we stopped wearing was suit and ties because it was too hot. You know, so we, I mean, it's like we started lowering what we thought was an expectation that God has. And God's like, I never told you to do that. God's like, you never, I never told you to wear your, put your faith shoes on the way somebody else was wearing their faith shoes. Not lower, modify. My, well, we didn't lower, lower our standards. We modified our standards. You know, and so my wife, we both did. Modified our dress code in terms of what we thought wasn't God's expectation. Yeah. And we discovered, oh, God didn't expect that of us. God didn't expect it of me to throw away all my Michael Jackson albums and all my Prince albums. Okay, there, I said it. Okay, all the stuff, all the music that I was raised on. God never said throw that stuff away, get rid of the record player. Now they're trying to bring all of that stuff back. Nowadays, they make you pay a subscription to even listen to it. Getting paid for it. I bought the album once, threw it away. Now I'm paying again to have it on my phone. Uh-oh, I said it again. Why? Because these are, these are expectations that we have created as human beings. And God's like, I didn't create those expectations. God says, just live a right fair and just life. How about being fair? You, you know, what does it mean to be fair? Equal, to be equitable. That means you treat everybody the same way. You do everything the same way to be fair. One of the slogans that I have that I have to live by is being firm, fair, and consistent. That's a, that's a motto I have to stand by. 
to be firm, fair, and consistent. That means I don't treat one person any different than I treat another person. I treat people equally, fairly, and the same. And that's what we have to do in society. Our society has not treated everybody equally and fairly. I remember, and this see, we're talking about expectations. I remember when I was a young person, a teenager growing up, and I had to start paying my own automobile insurance. And then I discovered they were charging, you know, we heard about it, we didn't know it was real or not, but redlining, that's not being fair. Just because I'm a certain skin color or I have a certain zip code, they charge me more for my automobile insurance. That is not fair. God, that's, see, God expects us to be fair. That means we treat everybody equally the same. Be, be fair. Be just. That means to deal justly with people. Be honest with people. To have integrity towards people. These are God's expectations. So that we can begin to raise our bar a little bit. And we can begin to see things the way the Father sees it. That's what he wants for us. To help them do what is right, fair, and just. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple. So like I said, keep it simple, make it fun. We like to keep it simple. That means the information that we're going to relay to you is going to be information that is going to benefit you. It's information that's going to help you. It's going to be, sometimes the, the information might seem a little elementary, but my question will be, do you understand what you are hearing? Do you understand what you are learning? If so, then you should get consistent, duplicatable results. God wants you to have consistency in your life. Okay, now verse four again, because it's got some, this is, this, is, this is just a small passage here in Proverbs for us to be able to understand God's expectations for our lives. Verse four again, these Proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. That's our responsibility is to transfer knowledge and discernment. Help our young people to understand, to have discernment, a level of understanding and comprehension. A lot of young people, I don't even know if they even realize it, you know, because I, I don't know. Maybe I've, I've just been teaching church. Maybe I need to go visit some other churches or something like that, I don't know, to, to get, a, get an idea about what other places are doing with our young people. And, um, you know, because of what I see and, and, the very, and a lot of disappointments that, I've, that we've been experiencing lately, you know, with young people and these mass shootings and another one today, you know, it's just, we, what are we going to do to help people to understand what we, how to change, how to give, how to help them have discernment? How do you do that? How do you help, how do you help someone get discernment? How do you do that? Well... One thing you could do is learn how to effectively communicate with them. Don't give them information too early and, and don't wait and belay the information and it's too late. There should be a season and a time where the information that we are giving our young people is appropriate. You know, our, the way these, uh, our society is nowadays, boy, it's all in your face. Everything is in your face. It's just right there. And the body of Christ has to step up its game to give our young people the arsenal of information so that they can learn how to discern what it is that they're going through and what it is that they're experiencing and what are, what's going on with their thoughts, what's going on with their emotions. And, it, and we need to have people that are healthy and strong to be able to convey that information to them. I'm so proud of my wife. She uh, has been doing counseling now with some young people uh, through BAM, which is uh, Building and Advancing Minds. And I'm just so proud of her because she's seen, she is actually seeing the results of what it is that she is helping to inform them. Now, because she can do it on a mental level, it's extremely helpful to help the young people, to give them something so that they can learn how to, how to overcome the, uh, the negative stigma of things that they may experience on, with their cell phones and, and the social media, social media world and, 
and what their friends are saying about them. You know, young people, teenagers are very vulnerable at that age range when they're young, impressionable by what they see, impressionable by what they what? See with their physical eyes. So they're driven by what they see. They're driven by what they hear. They're driven by the things that, the, and what they touch and what they engage with in their physical senses. And they have no clue and no perception, insight, of, and under, well, not all. So I'm not saying all don't. Some don't, quite a few don't, have the fullness of understanding of how to get a level of discernment, a level of understanding, a level of comprehension to know the difference between right and wrong, to know the difference between should I go shoot up somebody or not, to understand where those voices are coming from. It's like, are you, here? you hear voices? It's not a matter of voices, it's, it's thinking, it's our thoughts. And our thoughts are influenced by what we see around us and how we feel and emotionally, socially, all of these elements. See, and remember when we're talking about the paradigm, all of those elements are connected together. In order to change, we have to get new information in. And it's gonna require us to help people, young people, to be able to, de to develop the kind of knowledge and discernment. What's the age range approximately when a young person's mind is f begins to be fully developed? It's like 26 or something like that? Okay, so you're talking about 20, a 26-year-old's mind is still developing. Amen. Okay? And we need to constantly, when they reach that age of nowadays, boy, we got to back it up. Now you got to probably say eight, nine, ten. You know, kids are. Uh, my grandson the other day. He's he was asked where you want to go eat, and he mentioned a restaurant that was middle to upscale in its nature. Well, I'm like, what does he know about? And then he called, what does he know about this restaurant? Well, he's been exposed to it. He's a young child, six, seven, seven years old, young, and knows the difference, knows the expectations. So if our children understand the expectations, wouldn't it behoove us to find out what are God's expectations if children can figure it out to have a level of discernment, a level of comprehension, a level of understanding? They know the difference between good restaurants and bad restaurants. Okay, what is that I see? Okay, I see a line in my, okay, I'm sorry. So they know the difference. And so when they, because they know the difference, why can't we as adults know the difference? Discernment, okay. Verse five, he says, let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even, what? Wiser. Listen to the proverb. Listen to the wise saying. Listen to these I know one of the uh, passages or translation, it oh yeah, verse, latter part of verse six, these wise sayings, he says, and their riddles. You see, those are things that are, you know, a riddle, and, and, and it's unfortunate, but wh what happens when somebody tells you a joke and it goes over your head? Mm -hmm. Do you laugh at it? No, you missed the joke. You missed the punchline. You didn't get it. It's not until you understand all the words of what the, what the riddle or the joke was about. Then all of a sudden, two days later, oh, you bust up laughing. Oh, that's what it was. <laughs> no, God wants us to be able to have comprehension and understanding. He wants us to listen to these proverbs and become even wiser. Okay? God wants us to be wise. Sounds like God is dealing with, with us on the level of our mental capacities in this passage. Sounds like, it seems like God is trying to get our attention. That, and I say this many times, don't check your brain at the door. When you come into the things of God and you come into church, don't, don't come in and just sit your brain, your thinking patterns away. Oh, I don't have to think while I'm hearing the word of God. No, I want you thinking. We want, you, we want all the cylinders flowing and working. Because God wants you to be wise. And he wants you to become even, what? Wiser. These are God's expectations. You okay? Okay. All right, he says, now, um, uh, 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 verse, let's see, uh, middle part of verse five, he says, let those with understanding receive guidance. That means we have to remain teachable. It's a, it's a terrible thing to engage with somebody and they not be teachable. 
always remain teachable, open to guidance, open to direction. Be open. See, sometimes, you know, people who are not open, they don't, they're the worst, some of the worst people you have to deal with because they're not teachable. They know it all. Don't be a know it all with God. God knows everything. He's waiting for us to get it figured out. We're still, some of us, you know, you get 50, 60, 70 years old, still trying to figure it out. God wants us to be able to be teachable, open to his guidance. Let those with understanding receive guidance. So you got something. You have some level of understanding, but just because you got that little oomph, that little something you got, just remain teachable. I remain teachable. How do I remain teachable? I still read books. I still listen to other ministers. I, I remain teachable. I remain open because I want, I want God to minister more to me. I want God to give me more so that I can, so he can flow through me his, his teaching. He can flow through me what he wants. He can flow through me his expectations so that we can help other people to be able to receive. So that we can engage with people so that their lives can be better. That's the objective, not just to be a reservoir where we just keep all this stuff bottled up on the inside of us, but we need to be a flowing river. A, a river that's flowing has energy. Now, some reservoirs have power, like, a, like the Hoover Dam, you know, that has power. But look what's happening to the, to the waters here in the southwestern region of the United States. It's drought season. The, the water's going down, which means it's, the, it's less and less and less. So we don't, we don't want to just be a reservoir where we just block things from flowing through, but we want to be able to let the word of God flow through us. Let his, let his information and knowledge be open to share with your children. Be open to appropriate things. Help them to understand this warfare that's going on. Help them to understand. You know, when children, I was listening to the news just before the, we started going online tonight. Children are afraid to go to school. I don't want to go back to school because that's where, that's where my, my friend got shot. That's what a child is saying. I'm listening to NPR on the radio and they're talking about how children, you know, in this mass shooting that occurred in Texas, how the children were on the phones calling 911 for help in the classroom with a live shooter. It shouldn't be like that. Children should not have to deal with those kinds of things. But if they do, what are we doing as parents to help them navigate that? What are we doing to influence them to be able to give understanding? Because now they have a level of understanding about their world. They have a, they have, they have a certain perception of their world now. And so it's up to us to come and provide for them the kind of mental support, spiritual support, the uplifting that they're going to need in order to overcome those circumstances. Verse six, by exploring the meaning of these proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. Okay, so let me read the whole sentence all the way through from verse five to verse through to verse six. He says, let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning of these proverbs and parables, which are, he says, the words of the wise and their riddles. All of these things are, are important for us to do by exploring the, these meanings. This is the reason why you got to read books. This is the reason why you got to understand how your Bible works. You got to understand how the various genres of the Bible are flow together and, and what's history and what are letters, the difference between the two. What are the Psalms? What are the prophecies? You have to under, have a general understanding of all these things so you can make proper application of the word of God to your life. When you explore the Bible, you're going to discover that it, ha, it, it can affect every area of your life so that you can be successful. God wants you to have his kind of success in your life. <clears throat> verse 7, last, path, last verse. He says, for the, uh, he says, fear of the Lord. Now that word fear does not mean to be afraid. It means to have 
reverence and respect for God and his precepts. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, not false knowledge, because there's some false knowledge out there. There are people going about and saying what they, making up, making up mess, just trying to get people to believe. People saying things negatively about scripture and, and about other ministers and other pastors and things like that. See, you want to steer away from people, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> you want to steer away from people that are like that. So to have reverence and respect <coughs> for God's word and his precepts, he says it's the foundation. Say foundation. Foundation. Foundation is the most important element of a building. The foundation. If the foundation is not right, the rest of the building is going to be crooked. Or the rest of the building won't be able to stand. You know, you see these big, tall skyscraper buildings that they build, you know, look like they're a mile high almost. Or probably they are taller. And in order for those buildings to reach those kind of heights, they have to have a firm foundation. If they don't have a firm foundation, it's, it will crumble. Or worse yet, you can have a foundation that's crooked. And so you gotta have a plumb line, something to measure against. So you can make sure that it's straight. Otherwise, as soon as you get so many inches away, you can be what starts off as a teeny tiny fraction, fraction of an inch. All of a sudden, uh, 20 feet up, all of a sudden now the gap is an inch wide. And that's the way God wants us to understand when it comes to his expectations for our lives. We have to let the word of God become our foundation for our lives. The more we let the word of God become our foundation, our bedrock, the thing that we're standing on, whatever we build on top of that, when you're building your children, you're building your relationships, you're building your business, you're building uh, your education, you're building uh, whatever it is in your life that you're building, build it on a firm foundation. Yeah. And when you build on that firm foundation, as you go layer upon layer upon layer, and it stays straight, that means you're gonna have all the things, the information, the insight, the, what did he say at the beginning that we talked about? <clears throat> the fairness, the justness, and what is right. All of those things will align themselves with holiness. It will align itself with righteousness. It will align itself with God and his word so that his word can become the foundation and the bedrock for your life. That's the way God created Adam and Eve in the beginning. His expectations for Adam and Eve in the beginning was that they would oversee and govern the affairs of this earth. But sin crept in and violated them. Hmm. Why? Because fools despise wisdom and discipline. I didn't make that up. It says it right there in the latter part of verse 7. Okay. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. We don't want to be foolish. We don't want to be fools. We want to live holy. We want to have righteousness. We, we want to have his power and his anointing flowing and operating in our lives as never before. Okay? So these are all these things that we talk about tonight <clears throat> are God's expectations for us as believers. We, these expectations are tangible. These expectations are can be realized. Now, you, you will have opposition because the devil don't want you to do it. That's his job, is to create and wreak havoc in your life so that you get distracted and then you go on a 10, 20, 15 year journey away from the things of God. And God's like, okay, you, you ready to come back? You ready to come back? You ready, you ready to get on board with what I want you to do? You ready to get on board with my expectations for your life? Well, God will let you keep going down that road. Yep. He won't. He'll do everything he can to stop you. Some people have died on that road. Many people have, probably. Unfulfilled. Yeah. Unsuccessful in the things of God. And here God puts you in this earth realm for a purpose. And for a reason. 
And that purpose and reason should be realized. But it takes us, those of us that name the name of Jesus, those of us that teach the word of God, those of, those of us that are standing by what the word of God says to help the young, young in the things of God, or even just by nature, young in age, because they need to know that God is real. They need to know that God has not left them, God has not abandoned them, and God has not left them to have to fend for themselves here in this earth realm. And it's up to us to teach people to do that. Amen? Amen. All right, so in order for a person to come into the reality of that is, and we don't do this just to be, you know, filling up time, but it's important that people know Jesus and that people come into a right relationship with him through God's only begotten son. The scripture says, whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When we have this everlasting life, it's, a, it's about beginning the kingdom walk, the kingdom promises and the kingdom benefits in this life today. It's a very simple prayer to pray, to receive Jesus and to make him the Lord of your life. So if you'd like to receive, just repeat this after me. Say, dear God in heaven, I come to you as a sinner in need of a savior. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord, be my savior. I receive you right now and make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus name, amen. That's a very simple prayer to pray, to make Jesus your savior and Lord. Next thing you want to do is you want to go find and have a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church that is going to teach you the Word of God, that is going to help you grow, that is going to give you the watering and the food, the spirit food that you need in order to grow in the things of God. So you can have that wisdom flowing through you as never before. So find your Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church and uh, one that teaches the Word of God, the full benefits that's in the Word of God. You can always watch and listen to Vegas Christian Center uh, anytime, and you're welcome to come and fellowship with us at any time, if, particularly if you live here in the Las Vegas Valley community. I want to let you know you're truly loved and appreciated. I want to pray for you again, um, and this time I'm, I'm praying for your healing and for your health. You know, we, I know there are people out there that have ailments and things like that, and so we want to agree. I want to agree in faith and in prayer with you. And it's uh, just receive, just lay your hands on your body and just receive this prayer right now in the name of Jesus. Father, your word tells us to lay hands on the sick and your word declares that the sick shall recover. So I thank you, Father, according to Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, 1 Peter 2, 24 and Matthew 8, 17, where it talks about Jesus himself said that we lay hands on the sick. He says that the sick shall recover. And so we thank you, Father God, for health and healing being manifested in your people's body. I believe that they are healed right now from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus bore our sicknesses in his body. Um, in a couple of weeks, on the week of the 20th, we will be um, uh, supporting Pastor uh, Godwin and Becky Aziki at Faith Life Family Church. And so for those of you that are uh, dedicated watchers will be streaming that those services but come on out uh, faith life family church you can google his church and you can look it up we'll be there the week of the 20th uh, for his faith life family convention here in the las vegas area so we're just supporting him he's a brother in the lord he loves god he loves the lord and uh, just you know just want to support and he's invited us to come and be a part of that so we want to invite you to come and be a part of it as well hallelujah glory to god Okay, uh, for those of you that desire to support the ministry, you may do so at paypal.me slash vccbam. For those of you that live in Las Vegas, come on out, fellowship with us Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock a.m. for the teaching of God's Word. We start with some music at 9.30. And then on Wednesday, if you're watching, obviously, you know that we're here streaming on Wednesday nights at 7.30. And we want to agree in faith with you for those that give. So, Father, in Jesus' name, bless the givers exceedingly abundantly above all that they could ask or think because it's according to the power that works within them. Help them to know that you're real in their finances and bless them in a material financial way. Bring them success, Father. 
Help them realize your level of success in every area of their life. Hey, listen, you're loved and appreciated. We thank God for you. We'll be back here on Sunday and uh, uh, again next week, Wednesday. You're loved and appreciated. Have a great night and trust that God's expectations are showing up.